of 2 Corinthians, verse 1. We then, Paul says, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. We started there, and I want to just go back there because it's too important to pass up. We, as workers... Together. What? Together. What? Together. Say it again. Together. Hello? Workers together. That's what church is about. It's about us doing it together, not 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. Hey, we don't want to do that. We want, to, we want to be involved. We want to find that place. You may not be involved in everything, but you need to be involved in something. Amen? Right. Amen. Amen. But that's what's important. We don't want you involved. In, listen, if everybody just would take care of one item, just one thing, and do it to the best of their ability, I'm a, a billy, a billy, ability. You know you uh, thank you. If you do it to the best of your ability, I'm going to tell you, what a church, you know, if people just do that. But what happens is you have just a handful, and they wind up getting stretched so thin that before long they say, you know what, I'm through, I can't do it anymore. And so we're looking for somebody else to fill their spot. Nobody wants to fill that spot, it's too big. Just find one area of ministry that you feel like you can do, and then give it everything you've got. That's doing it together. That's what Paul's talking about here. We then, as workers together, with who? Who's him? Yeah, I mean, we can't do it without him, can we? It's the Lord's work. It's not ours, it's his. And so we allow him to do these things through us. I beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. If you've been saved, you've been saved by his grace. And Paul's saying to these Christians of Corinth, these church members of Corinth, listen, if God saved you by grace, don't let it be in vain by you sitting on the sidelines never doing anything. Get involved. Find your spot. If you're not, it's like you're saved in vain. God saved you for a purpose. There's something God wants you to do. What is it? Thank you. Work together. Amen. Amen. I don't think it's to sit on the sidelines. I really don't. I think it's to find your spot and get involved. And I think that's so important for us to remember. Verse 2. And he saith, God said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored or helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, he just mentioned don't receive uh, the grace of God in vain. And then this is a parenthesis. For he saith, God saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted. I've listened. I've listened to you. I've, I've come when you've asked me to call. I've been there. And he says, now, now's the time. Now's the time to get involved. Now's the time. If you're unsaved, now's the time to get saved. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Receive that grace now. And if you've received that grace, live in that grace today. Make it, make it, make it 100%. Just go all the way. Allow God to do that. He's ready to help you here, just like he helped you in your salvation. He's ready to help you in your daily walk. We've been dealing with that, and I hope that you're getting that point because it's so important. Behold, now is the day of salvation, he says. Now, in verse 3, giving no offense into anything that the ministry be not blasphemed. Whoa, my goodness. Oh, giving no offense. Oh, that can be difficult sometimes, can't it? You know what it says? It says we ought to strive for that. There's going to be times when we have to take a stand and it's going to offend somebody who's just not going to, not going to abide by what God says. We understand that. But there ought to be something inside of us that desires not to offend, not to hurt, not to push people away, not to, you know, I just, I think it's a shame if we get that place. Somebody, oh, I, somebody said, who are you telling me about? They're not going to that church anymore. Don't tell me who it is. Uh, Ruby was telling me about somebody that moved off. Oh, I know. Moved off. And they're looking for a church. They walked into a church, and immediately they were, the dress was a little too short because it was above the ankle. And they didn't have their hair put up just right. And in the course of the sermon, the pastor calls out a lady because her hair's too long or too short or something. 
but she needed to cut her bangs. Yeah. You know, you, you, you can be offensive if you want to. That's pretty easy to do, right? I mean, we could just walk around the room and just offend people. But why would we want to do that? We're the children of God. We, we belong to the same family, you know? Let's find a way to love each other and care about each other. Even if we disagree on some things, it's okay, you know? Because we can move forward. Do what? Yeah, we're rednecks. We're rednecks. You're right. We're rednecks. So that means we get along. Amen. We get along. We find a way to get along. We don't have to agree with everybody. We don't have to agree with each other. You know, you may not like the way I wear my hair. I may wear it a little long. I don't know. Maybe that's what you think. You don't like my men bun. I don't know. Maybe that's the case. You know, maybe you got a problem with that. But you know what? It doesn't matter because guess what? We can still love each other. Amen. Do what? Do what? Too short. My bangs are too short, oh my goodness. <laughs> you guys are cut ups. Do what? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And not lock them in, let's love them in. That's a better term. Let's just love them in, you know? Love them in. It won't hurt a thing. You know, yeah, no matter what the situation is, you know, you just, you, you, you love them, you, you accept them, you bring them in. God will change them. You don't have to change them. God does that. God does such a better job of changing people than we ever will. We need to work at not offending them. We need to work at loving them, accepting them. I'm not saying accept their sin. Some people wants to, they want to twist the things I say. I'm telling you what, I, just, I, I, I hate sin. I don't care what sin you're involved in. I hate it. But I'm going to love the devil out of you. Right? And I hope you do me the same. Because I know I got some things wrong. Not many, but a few. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we love each other and we accept each other. Even if sometimes it means hugging somebody that you wouldn't normally hug. It's okay. It's okay. They're not going to rub off on you. You know what amazes me? I, I'm going to get off my notes now. You know what amazes me? we got people that really think if they get around somebody that doesn't believe just like they do, they're going to rub off on them. Oh, wow. I, had, I had a fella say something the other day about, well, I ain't going to have anything to do with those Catholics. I can tell you that right now. Well, you didn't marry into my, my little old family-in-law. You realize what a mess I'd have made if I decided I wasn't going to have anything to do with Catholics? Huh? Good night. <laughs> There's going to be, yeah. I, I don't know that anywhere in the Bible it says you've got to be a Baptist to go to heaven, nor Catholic, nor Pentecostal, nor anything else. I don't find that in the Bible at all. I'll tell you what I do find. God says for us to love each other. That's true. I mean, I do that all the time. Any place I go, I usually try to say, tell me what denomination you're from. Yell it out. Yeah. I say, nobody, nobody in heaven cares. You know that? Nobody cares. They don't care who, what denomination you belong to. I'll tell you what they do care about. Jesus said they will know you by your love. That's what he said. We love each other. Now, you say, Brother Jim, now you've turned into one of them lovey-dovey preachers and you don't, ever, you don't preach on hell and sin. Oh, yes, I do. That's true. There is no lovey-dovey nail. That's going to be bad, isn't it? Well, let's continue. All right, let's go on. Y'all are, y'all are into this. I like it. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry might be blamed. Might not be blamed. That's what Paul says. He said, guard the ministry of God. Guard this ministry of Christ. Make sure you make it what it's supposed to be. Let people see it for what it is. You know the reason we can't get people to church? Because people don't see church the way God wants them to see it. They see it like a bunch of people that don't get along. They see it like, well, y'all are a bunch of Baptists over there and the Methodists up there. Y'all don't even get along. Yes, we do. We love each other. We used to do a lot of things together. Things have happened that well, don't let us, but it, I promise you it's not because of us. It's not because of me. I, I love them to death. I love all of them to death. You know, we'll go across the tracks. We go across the river. You know, good night. Yeah, the Bible says that. That's right. We're supposed to love and we're supposed to care about each other and we're supposed to make sure that whatever we do, we don't bring any kind of negativity towards the church. 
This is the, this is the visible witness of God to the world right here, right here in this room. This is the visible witness. Be careful. Don't mess it up. Amen? That's what Paul's saying. Don't mess it up. Make sure you live in such a way that you are that witness. Verse 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as, men, as the ministers or servants of God. How do we do that, Paul? In much patience. Well, let's stop there for a second. There's a number of these things we're going to... In fact, the rest that we're going to spend several verses now that are just words. Just words. But he says, how do we, how do we live this before people? How do, we, how do we be the ministers of God? How do, we, how do we look like that? He begins with patience. Patience. What does that look like around the church? Uh, honestly, I'm asking you. What does that look like around the church? What do you think it would look like? Endurance. Patience, endurance. Okay. Not easily offended. That's good. Yeah, learn to get along. Patience, waiting on people, waiting on God. You know, don't get. Amen. Remembering, yeah, that's good. Remember how you were when you were at that spiritual level they are. Don't get all hyped up. They, you know, well, you need to be doing this, that, and the other. Well, how long was it before you did it? Well, 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 we'll talk about that. Yeah, still working on it. Endurance, patience. I tell you what, James has a lot to do about patience, doesn't he? He said, let patience have its perfect work. I just love, I love that statement. You know I do, because I think we need to live there. I, growing up, they always said, don't ever pray for patience. Well, you better, because God says you better have it. And he said, let patience have its perfect work. That means waiting until God does something. That's perfect work. Waiting for God to do what he's going to do. Waiting on people to get where God wants them to be. That's patience that's having its perfect work. Then he says, patience. What's the next one? Uh, okay, mine says, in afflictions. In afflictions, tribulations. Spiritual, physical, emotional, any kind of suffering is afflictions. So here it says, let's go back. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers or servants of God. How? In afflictions. Well... <laughs> The greatest work God can do in a person's life is when they're going through problems. You will learn more about God when you're going through problems than you ever will out here flitting around, no problems at all. It's when you have problems, when you depend upon God, when God draws you down to understand who he is. That's important. We need to understand we ourselves as them ministers, the servants of God in afflictions. How do you respond to your afflictions? How do you respond to those circumstances? We dealt with this uh, Sunday night. Afflictions. And then in necessities, the tough times we have to go through. Necessities. We're fixing to find out about necessities, amen? Yeah. I'm afraid we are. We Americans, we're so spoiled rotten. You want a roll of toilet paper? Just run down to the store and pick one up. You want some Wheaties off the shelf? Just run down the shelf and pick it up. You want some gas for the car? It's no problem. Just go down to the gas station and buy you about a gallon for $25, you know? <laughs> necessities. I'm talking about necessities, things that we need to live. It, it, Paul says this is something we, we grow, but in all things approving ourselves as the servants of God in necessities. We dealt with this Sunday, Sunday night again, I think it was Sunday night, that he said that um, Paul says that in all things, so he says, uh, I've learned to be content in everything. I've learned to be content in everything. Um, that's not what he says, but that's what I got out of it. <laughs> um, in all things. Yeah, in all things, learn to be content. We talked about satisfied Sunday morning. Learn to be satisfied. Learn that your satisfaction is not in what you have. It's not in how much you have. It's in God, period. End of sentence. Jesus Christ. That's all we need. So when necessities come, if my, if, I, if my necessities are filled by Jesus Christ, I don't, ha I don't have a need for anything, amen? He's plenty. You say, well, you don't have as much as somebody else. I don't need as much as somebody else. I need what God's given me, and this is what God's given me. And I tell you, as long as, as, long as God's looking down on me, as long as he's walking with me through the valley of the shadow of death, as long as he said he'll never leave me nor forsake me, what else do I need? I've got all we need.
You have all you need. Then he says, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers or servants of God in distresses, the trials with no escape, the distresses, the problems that don't end, the cancer that has gotten worse, the uh, money situation that is unresolvable, the family situation that it's just not going to get any better. In distresses, he said, we need to learn that we, in anything, give no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. And he says, we are, we approve ourselves as the ministers of God. That's what's important. Even in the distresses, the things that won't ever stop. It's important that we, we have that ability in those moments. You know, there's so many times in our lives, and I think all of us have gotten times like this, when there just was no answer. You know? How did you respond? That's where we have the opportunity to be the ministers of God. The way we respond to situations that have no answers. What a great place for us to be a witness to the world. They, they, they get ballistic. They, they don't know how to handle it. But we can show them. Verse 5, let's just go on. In stripes, that's physical uh, problems, physical blows, literally. Physical blows. If anybody knew that, Paul did. Man, one beat up preacher. I mean, he was beat over, he was beaten in the face, left for dead, stoned with rocks. Whew. You may have had a stripe or two, but it might have come in a way of an a unthought out word that somebody said that hurt you. And, those, and I'm not saying those don't hurt, they do, they're miserable. But he said, even in those things, we should be a minister. We should be a servant of God even in times of that. Think of uh, Stephen in stripes. There he is being stoned to death, taking his last breath and saying, Father, they don't know what they're doing. You know? Hold this not to their charge, he says. Let's go on. In imprisonments, well, Paul understood about that, amen? Some of you may have understood that. I don't know if there's anybody in here that's been in prison or not. I was in prison for six years. Of course, I was preaching every week out there, but <laughs> I got to meet uh, I, uh, the fellow that I uh, camped out with during Trace Diaz had been in the prison for seven years. God, phew, I'm going to have him come preach to you. You're going to go, are you kidding me? Because that boy can preach. He got a hold, God had got a hold of him while he was in prison. One of the things I used to tell the guys at prison, I said, guys, you're in spiritual boot camp. You have the opportunity while you're in, in prison, like no other time. You can read your Bible every day, all day. You can study. You can do it. I mean, you have the ability right now to do that. And if you waste it while you're in here, shame on you. And I'd challenge you to do that. Might want to check that one out. I'm sure they're just having a good time. How are we doing? All right, we're good. Uh, imprisonments, in tumults, that's riots. We may have a few of those around, amen? We're seeing it more and more. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? I mean, you know, you're going to pull out your 9 millimeter and blast a few? Is that what, I mean, is that how you're going to handle a riot? You know? You know, we've got to think about, we, we've got to make a difference. We're the children of God. We're to be different. Everything all right? Oh, race, okay. <laughs> Good. Sound like they were struggling with it. All right, uh, in labors. Now, these three things, watch this. I like this. These are self-inflicted trials. Labor, that's hard work. <laughs> you can get in trouble doing that. In watchings, that's sleepiness, basically. In fastings, that's hunger. So these three things are self-inflicted trials, and God said even in these things, we should be a witness. We should be the ministers of God in these things letting people see god work in us through those times when we're suffering maybe from hard work maybe harder than we can handle sometimes let them see god in us in your watchings in the times when it's hardest for you to stay awake let them see that in fastings when you're hungry verse six goes on he's not through now he gives us nine positive qualities of the evidence of staying or a, a evidence of this being a minister of God by pureness, staying pure, keeping our hearts right. 
striving for holiness. I, I really believe, and you, and you know this is true, and I think you'd agree with me. One of the, I think one of the things we're missing in churches is people striving for holiness. It's like, I live by grace, and so I just live any way I want to. You know, if you're, if you're really under grace, there ought to be a desire for holiness there. You know, you understand it comes from God. That's important. But there ought to be some, there ought to be some holiness in our lives, a desire to live right. If you've, got a, if you've got a habitual sin in your life, are you working on it at all? Are you allowing God to do anything at all? Or have you just accepted, well, this is just who I am, this is the way I'm going to be? I mean, if that's the case, then you've given up on holiness in your life. You're not staying pure. You're accepting your impurity. Instead, God says we need to be pure. We ought to strive for this pureness. By knowledge, know and stand on the truth. Amen? I, I, I can't stand it when somebody claims to be a Christian and they spout something that has nothing to do with the Bible and they preach it as truth. I just can't stand that. I just want to stand up and shout. No, it's not right. <laughs> you, 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 you don't know the Word. You know, get, get in the Word. Find the truth because you need to know the truth. We're to stand. We're to stand on the knowledge of the truth by long-suffering, tolerance, tolerance for people that come in late. <laughs> Lovingly tolerant. I love you, Mary, and I'm glad you're here. You got here just in time. You did so good. Thank you for that. Tolerance. We need to have that, that long suffering. The word itself speaks of it. Long suffering. This isn't just patience. This is putting up with something you don't like. Long suffering. You know, somebody's standing there hitting your thumb with a hammer over and over and over again, and you're taking it, that's long suffering. Amen. No, that's stupidity. Yeah, you're right. But you understand what I'm saying? Long-suffering, allowing people to be, to be dumb sometimes and sticking with them until they finally figure out that's not what God wants or God meant. Long-suffering. Kindness, goodness in action, kindness. We're missing kindness today. We're missing kindness. People are so afraid somebody's going to take advantage of them they forgot how to be kind to one another. You, you know, it doesn't take much. Ruby and I pulled into uh, yesterday morning. We're going, we're going out, right? We hadn't had breakfast, so I said, you want to stop and get an apple fritter over across the street? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Well, we pulled up, and guess what? They didn't have any more apple fritters. But they had cinnamon rolls. So we got a cinnamon roll and a cup of coffee. Little old girl behind the table, she, did, she, she, was, she was needing a blessing. You know what I mean? You ever meet people like that? Just a little kindness, that's all she needed. Somebody say, you know what, I appreciate you. So I gave her a $10 bill and said, you just keep that change, that's your tip. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but you thought I'd given her a million dollars. She stood back and, well, thank you so much. It doesn't hurt to be kind. And I'm not saying giving money is always kind, but we need to be kind one to another. Amen? Just kind. Sure. That's right. That's right. Make them laugh. Make them, you know... You get, the, uh, you get the caller, you know, we all get them, right? The warranty people calling to get your warranty on your car. You know, you want to go, so you say it's all me, wait! Next time go, hallelujah, I'm so glad you called. How are you doing? Where are y'all from? And they're going, what, what? I said, where are you from? I'm in Texas, where are you at? Well, uh, I'm in Pennsylvania. Was it snowing up there? I mean, just start visiting with them. You're not going to buy anything. No, you do, yeah. Sometimes I'll just hang up. They go, really? Yeah. Ruby and I, a lot of times we get them on the phone, and, and uh, I'll see it's from New York City. Well, you know, if I, I don't know anybody in New York City. 
So I pick up the phone and say, baby, somebody from New York City is calling us. Is this somebody from New York City? Are you calling us? And Ruby's in the background. See if it's our rich uncle. Maybe he's, maybe he's left us something. Are you our rich uncle? Have you left us something? About that time, this guy says, okay, I get it. Click. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to be mean. You know what I'm saying? You can have a little fun. Make, give them a giggle. Let them laugh. Be kind. Amen? And I'm, I'm going to tell you, in this world, kindness will stand out because there's very few people that are kind anymore. And we need that. Be kind. Paul says that's another way we can serve. And then notice this, by the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Ghost. Do you know, here's some things the Bible tells us about the Holy Ghost. We're to walk in the Holy Spirit. We're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're to be gifted by the Holy Spirit. The, we minister in His power, the Holy Spirit. We follow His leading. We're taught by Him. We pray in the Spirit. We worship in the Spirit. We do not want to grieve the Spirit, and we do not want to quench the Spirit. Do you think the Spirit's important for us as Christians? You better know He is. And if you as a Baptist have a problem with somebody talking about the Holy Ghost or the Spirit, you, you need to get over that because He is very much vital in your life. Now, He doesn't do all the things some people think He does, but He's always involved in your life in so many ways. And you need to understand that. And he's the one where we get the power for living. That's what it's all about. That's where we get the power to be kind, to be long-suffering and have knowledge and purity. That's where we get the power to do that, through him. By the Holy Ghost, he says. And by love unfeigned, that is genuine love. Not fake it till you make it kind of love. Real love. You catch yourself in a moment where you, you put on the little face and you're going to give a little love, you know. And you catch yourself going, this isn't real. I need to be real in my love. And all of a sudden, you, you make the change inside you. I, I do. I know how to do that. I, I catch myself, you know. You walk in my office, I'm trying to study, and you, you know, I can't, I don't have time for you right now. I don't, oh, hi, how are you? I'm so glad you dropped in, you know. And I know inside that's not genuine love. I've got to make a change. That's not genuine so all of a sudden, I'll calm down and say, you know what, I've got all day tomorrow to pitch that sermon. What is, what's on your heart? What's, what's troubling you? What do you what, tell me something. Well, it doesn't take that much longer. And it's, it's genuine love, unfeigned love. That's the kind of love we're supposed to have for each other. Verse 7, by the word of truth. That's the Bible, amen? <laughs> we get back to that good old word. I'm so glad it got back to that. Because that's where I find my strength. That's where I find everything I need. Right there. I got everything I need. Right there on those pages. Those little black and white words. They, 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 and some of them read. They, they say everything I need to know right there. I, I don't need anything else. I like other books. I like movies. I like things like that. But this is all I need right here. This is all I need right here. If you're struggling because you can't seem to figure out what God wants... I promise all you need to do is ask yourself, how much time have I spent in God's Word? You're going to find out real quick the answer why you're having a hard time figuring it out. You're not spending enough time in this. It, and it really doesn't matter how much time you spend, it's never enough. But you've got to start somewhere. Some of you need to start. Some of you, I've been on you, and I've been on you, and I've been on you. And I don't know for sure, but I'm just telling you, I'm pretty sure in this room there's some people that have not gotten into the Word of God every day. Some of you didn't make it today. You may not have made it this week. How do you expect to live without the Word of God? This is our bread. This is our food. This is what we live on. You wouldn't think about getting up and going to work without breakfast, and you sure wouldn't think about going two or three days without eating, but yet you can go without the Word of God. Do you realize what a problem that says is going on in your life? You've got to have the Word of God. You've got to. <clears throat> by the word of God, by the power of God. Woo! Not being clever, not using your own abilities. This is about the power of God in your life to accomplish the things God wants you to do. If it's reading God's word, then God can empower you to do that. If it's if it's, if it's talking to somebody at work or someplace where you, you shop about the Lord, God's power is upon you. You have that within you. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and He's all power. All you have to do is trust Him. He'll fill you up, and you'll be ready to go in His power. 
by the word, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Woo! Let me ask you a question. You tell me. The right hand and the left. What? Is that important? Is there something about that? What do you think that means? Why would he say that? We're all the way through the scriptures. We're all the, way through the right hand of God, the right hand of God. Here he says the right hand and the left. What do you think he's saying? Everything. All of it. You got more than enough. You have the, the armor of righteousness on the right hand and the left. You're completely ready. You're completely covered in his armor. You're ready for the battle. You have the Spirit of God. You have the power of God. You have the sword of the Spirit. You've got everything you need. But when you don't, <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. You got your shield on? I got it. Where is it? Oh, wait a minute. It's here somewhere. I, I stuck it in my pocket. Yeah. She said, someday she gets up and she says, oh, I've got the helmet of salvation. I'm okay. What about the rest of it? You know, there's plenty of other pieces of armor. We need to have it all. Truth, spirit, faith, all of those things. We need them all. I've got, I've got four minutes. Can we do this? We're going to cover the last part of eight, nine, ten, real quick. Watch what happens. Listen to it, and then I want to ask you in each one. He says, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Okay, let's start with the first one. You'll get it. What's this? Paul said that a man of God living in Christ under the power of the Holy Spirit will live a paradoxical life. I'll show you how I mean that. Watch this. Paradox means they oppose each other. Honor, dishonor. Here's Paul. Let's just look at Paul. Is there honor in Paul's life as a, as a spirit-filled Christian? Sure, we see that, don't we? Is there dishonor? Sure, the lost world hates him. I mean, they're going to wind up killing him. Honor, dishonor. Evil report, good report. Is there a good report for somebody like Paul or somebody like you that's walking in the Spirit? Well, sure there is. Because we see the Spirit of God working in you. Is there an evil report? Sure. There's people who don't like that. As deceivers and yet true. Listen, you don't have to go far to find preacher. You'll say, my preacher preaches the truth. And you're right, I do. But you don't have to go far to find somebody say, your preacher doesn't preach the truth. You can find them. Unknown and yet well known. Boy, if that was not it. <laughs> That's most of us. Amen. I tell you what, you're well known around here, amen? But go down the street and they don't know who you are. Well known and unknown. As dying and behold we live. <laughs> we die in Christ, amen? And yet we live, isn't that what Paul says? Nevertheless I live, yet not, Christ, not I, but Christ who lives in me. Chastened and not killed. Boy, I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Chastened and not killed. Sometimes God's after me. He takes me to the woodshed. But thank goodness he didn't kill me, amen? <laughs> As sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. Sorrowful and rejoicing, yeah. You know, we can be sorrowful in the fact that the things of people of God around us or even in our own life, we can't seem to maintain that level of, of holiness. There can be sorrow. But boy, those days when we have it, there's rejoicing. Uh, poor and yet making many rich. Boy, I tell you, you can see that in a Christian life. It has nothing to do with money, by the way, right? How do you make people rich? By feeding their spirit, by giving them what they need, by encouraging them, by being kind, by loving them. That's making people rich. Making them realize that they're special because they have a friend like you. That's the richest. Who's the richest man in town? Uh, well, okay. All right, thank you. You are. You're right. <laughs> I was talking about the movie. <laughs> Who was the richest man in town? 
<clears throat> no, he said the, the man who had friends. His brother writes to him and says, to the richest man in town because he had friends, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. George Bailey, yeah, thank you, George Bailey. You got it, you got it. He's rich, the richest man in town, having nothing and yet possessing all things. How many of you are like that? You should all raise your hand to that. Having nothing and yet possessing all things. All of us have that. What an amazing thing God does in our lives. I'd love to go on, but we're going to have to stop there. Uh, I, I'm going to stop there. I really had planned to get to that next verse, but we're done. We're, we're already at that time. Any question, comment, or thought? Okay. Amen. Did y'all hear that? Six-year-old said that. Said, uh, said uh, what is a friend? And she said, if you want to learn, to love if you're going to be a friend, you need to learn to, or learn to love better. Learn, start by with a friend who you hate. Start with a friend who you hate. Boy, that's good, isn't it? Amen. It is a good lesson. All right, anybody else? Question, comment, or thought? All right, well, we're glad you're here tonight, and I hope you'll take a minute to say hi to everybody before you cut out. And uh, choir tonight, those of you that inquire, make sure and come on up and get ready to sing. Is uh, Jim's going to be ready? He's ready. And uh, we'll have a great day Sunday. Uh, Sunday, I'm continuing the message I started on Isaiah 55. And... Um, I tell you, Isaiah 55 is amazing. I'm going to cover the next three verses, three through five. That's all I'm going to cover. But boy, 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 boy. Talking about the, the relationship with God, the covenant relationship with God. What an amazing thing it is that God has given us. We'll be talking about that Sunday. So hope that you'll be here Sunday morning for that. All right, let's stand and be dismissed in a word of prayer. We thank you for being here. And um, if you're not in choir, visit for just a minute and then scoot out so they can get on with their practice, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this afternoon and for your word. I pray, Father, that you'll take the things we've heard and apply them this week in our lives. As we walk out of here, as we begin our day tomorrow, may we consider, Father, that we are to be your ministers. We're to be the servants of God. We are your hands and feet, and we are the witness to this world. May we live in such a way that the world sees you in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.